Good afternoon and welcome back once again. This is Sunday, June the 7th, 2020. And this is the evening service or recorded for the sake of the evening service uh, as we are continuing to uh, do this particular service from home. It is our hope that, uh, that you have been able to assemble with us uh, this morning if you are in the area. Uh, nevertheless, if not, it, uh, continue to worship God, uh, continue to serve Him, and may these lessons online be helpful as well. Uh, let's go ahead and get started with our lesson this evening. Uh, I ask you to turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, where this evening and this afternoon I'm going to talk about confessing Christ. Uh, something that I started a little bit last year was on the first Sunday of each month, I wanted to present a first principles lesson, and I haven't done that the last couple of months because of the circumstances that we've been dealing with, but now as we uh, strive to move toward normalcy again in the near future, uh, I, I want to resume as many of the lessons based upon what we were doing prior to this virus as I can. And so uh, I'm going to present a first principle lesson here this morning. This is something that uh, uh, it's a topic that we all need to give consideration to. And hopefully in some way, if, if you are already a child of God, that this will be helpful if you are trying to teach others about what is involved in becoming a Christian and living the Christian life. So this morning or this afternoon, we're going to talk about the subject of confessing Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, Paul, in his final admonition to Timothy, says this. He says, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God, who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing. So here we find Paul encouraging Timothy to to uh, co to con to live his life based upon this con good confession that he has been engaged in. Confession is one of those subjects that we need to give consideration to both as becoming Christians, but also living our lives as Christians. And that is the approach of this particular lesson. And we find here, we, we begin by asking the question, what actually is confession? Well, when we think about the term, what often comes to our mind is a courtroom. And it's the idea of acknowledging uh, something. And th that's really a simple definition of the word. It's an acknowledgement of something that convicts you for who you are or something that you've done, the way that you're living or something to that effect. And when we talk about uh, this confession as a Christian, what it is is it's an acknowledgement that you believe in Jesus Christ, that you believe who he is, and that you uh, have professed that you are following him, and you are going to follow him, and you are going to reject any and every other Savior. So that's the idea of what confession actually is. Now, confession is something that is emphasized in a number of different texts in Scripture. For example, over in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, Paul there tells these brethren, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So in this text, Paul here notes that we need to make a confession, a confession concerning Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus, if we are to be saved. So it is something that leads toward our salvation. And that actually brings us to the text that we began this particular study with, where Paul encourages Timothy here to, um, uh, to live his life having confessed this good confession. Let's talk a little bit about that good confession uh, for a few moments.
Uh, first of all, we note in the text that it says there that Timothy confessed this before many witnesses. And so that tells us that this is something that is proclaimed publicly. Typically, before I baptize somebody, I will ask them, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Are you willing to make him Lord or ruler of your life? Because it is something that somebody needs to understand as they become Christians. So when you talk about this good confession that Timothy made, what exactly was this confession? And Paul actually gives us an illustration of that by pointing to Jesus in the next verse, where, where, where he notes there that Jesus, before Pontius Pilate, um, witnessed the good confession. And so we get an idea there of what is associated with this. Over in Matthew's account of Jesus as he stood before Pilate, Jesus there notes that Pilate asked Jesus, are you a king? And Jesus acknowledged there in verse number 11 of that text, it is as you say. So Jesus is acknowledging, uh, and where we are concerned, this would be the um, the expression of Jesus says, yes, I am, uh, I am going to be Lord, and I am going to be king over many. John actually elaborates on this a little bit as, as he deals with Jesus before Pilate. And what we read there in that text, John 18, and beginning in verse number 33, we read there that Pilate, as he entered the praetorium, called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, are you speaking for yourself about this, or, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered him, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered from the, uh, to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So Jesus acknowledges he is a king. But one thing we understand about the way that Jesus does this when we put all these texts together is Pilate understood that he was not trying to overthrow the Roman Empire. Uh, G Pilate still found no fault in him. Nevertheless, Jesus acknowledges, uh, I, I am Lord. And that is something that everybody needs to understand and everyone needs to believe these things. I'm convinced that that's the confession that Paul is reminding Timothy that he made early on as a child of God and that he was continuing to make even as Paul is writing this. And we'll get back to that a little bit later. But there's also some other verses that you would give consideration to. We've already mentioned in, in uh, Romans chapter 10 and in verse number 9 where, where Paul says, uh, uh, with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And over there in verse number 9, he talks about uh, you must confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. We also have Matthew 16 verses 15 through 18. And in this particular text here, uh, we have Jesus speaking to Peter and the other apostles. And, and this is where uh, Jesus asks Peter, uh, who do men say that I am? And uh, Peter responds that uh, among those that we've talked to, there are some who think you're John the Baptist, others Elijah having, ret uh, having returned to earth, or, or one of the prophets. Um, uh, but Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And in verse 16, we read there that Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Here's Peter making the great confession, if you will, acknowledging that he knows exactly who Jesus is. And of course, Jesus responds, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give to you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And he goes on from there. Jesus notes that based upon this acknowledgement of who he is, that Jesus is going to build his church. This is something that is extremely important. It is important that people understand who Jesus is, that he was not just simply one of many 
prophets, but rather he is Lord. He is the Son of God. He is the Christ, which is a word that means the, the promised Messiah that they were looking for. We have another occasion that's, that's interesting over in uh, the book of John. This is in John 11, verses 20 through 27, and the context here is Jesus, or, or uh, Jesus has, has gone to, to Bethany where he has heard of Lazarus recently dying. And of course, Jesus has the intent of raising Lazarus from the dead. Now, Lazarus had two sisters, Mary and Martha, that, and all of them were very close to Jesus. And, and when uh, Mary hears that Jesus is there, uh, she tells Martha, and Martha goes out to Jesus. And that's the conversation that we have in Luke 11 and beginning in verse number 20, where it says, as Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give it. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Mary said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So here Jesus is declaring, I am the resurrection. I am the hope that you have of a future resurrection. And if you believe in me, uh, there will be a future resurrection. Of course, we know that Jesus also intended to physically raise Lazarus. Um, but nevertheless, he's giving that promise. But now notice the response of Martha in verse number 27. It says there that she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is come into the world. That is the good confession. Jesus says you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Another passage we might give consideration to is over in Acts chapter 8. Here we find that uh, there is a eunuch who had been to Jerusalem to worship God, and he is returning to his home in, in Ethiopia where, where he served. And in the process of doing so, he is reading uh, a scroll from uh, the old law, namely the scroll, the scroll of Isaiah. Well, Philip, by the Spirit, is told to go and meet him on the way, and Philip does. And as the chariot passes by, Philip joins the, the eunuch within the chariot, and, and uh, he asks if he understands what he's reading, and, uh, and the eunuch doesn't. And so Philip, uh, beginning with Isaiah 53, opens the scripture, and he preaches Jesus to him. And, and as he continues to preach Jesus to him, we find that uh, in verse number 36, it says, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He commanded the chariot to stand still. Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. And, and it goes on to say that, that as, the, as they came up out of the water, uh, that the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, but the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. And so here we find uh, Philip making this confession where he observes that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Uh, he wants to follow after Christ. And it's interesting here that Philip has been preaching Christ to Jesus, and, and a part of that preaching was God's plan of salvation, and it involved be, being baptized. And that's what the eunuch wanted to do. But it needed to be understood before he was baptized why he was being baptized. He needed to know what he was doing. And that's what we have uh, with this particular example of the uh, of this good confession. And so you can put all of these verses together and you can see that the good confession, it involves the fact that Jesus is the Christ. It involves the fact that he is the Son of God and that he is Lord. So it's understanding who Jesus is and a willingness to follow Christ 
after him. Now, there are many other observations that we could make in dealing with this confession. A couple of, uh, of thoughts to consider. Number one is it is to be a public confession. And that's what we see in, in, in many of these examples that we've looked at. Uh, over in 1 Timothy 6 and in verse number 12, where Paul is talking to Timothy there, he talks about how you made this confession before many witnesses. In Acts 8 and in verse 37 that, that we just read about, um, um, the eunuch is making this confession before Philip. He's acknowledging his belief in who Jesus is. So maybe there was just one or two there. We don't know whether uh, the eunuch had a chariot driver with him, or maybe there was a few others, uh, but it's a small group. Nevertheless, the confession is publicly and openly made. You can turn over to Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, and here we have an occasion where Jesus is sending out his apostles uh, as he's trying to build them up as to everything that they've learned and letting them know that God's going to be with them. And he notes that wherever you go, don't worry about what you're going to say. It's going to be given to you at that time. And uh, he warns them that there are going to be some who are going to reject you. I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, he says there in verse 16. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Uh, and he says, you're going to be betrayed by some as a result of this. Uh, but nevertheless, keep preaching. God knows what's going on. And then we have this observation in verse 32. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. And he goes on and describes how, again, there are going to be, as you're teaching, some are going to accept him and some are going to reject him. So you've got this idea of acknowledging Jesus before men. All of these things point to how this is a public confession. But something else we consider as we think about this confession is, is it is a step that leads toward salvation. And it is something that precedes baptism for the remission of sins. And again, I appeal to Acts chapter 8, verse uh, 37, and that particular context where uh, the eunuch is asked, here's water, what hinders me from being baptized? And, and we have this confession that is recorded. Uh, and, and after that, the chariot is stopped and, and the eunuch is baptized. Over in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that we've already talked about, uh, uh, it talks about uh, with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And that word unto is a word that means in the direction of or toward. In other words, salvation is going to come after this has taken place. And it doesn't mean that it's immediate as one has uh, confessed, but rather it's in that direction. And, and, and I, I tie that together with other passages to show that we need to be baptized after we confess Christ. I'll give, I'll give you as an example, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. This is, this is on the day of Pentecost where, where Peter is preaching to the multitude there, and, and they were cut to the heart and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter says to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. I want you to note that, that Peter, as he tells them what to do, he says, you need to re repent of the sins that you've committed, but you also need to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Well, uh, not only does that explain what is involved as somebody is baptized, that they need to understand why they're doing it, but also it's something that, that needs to be acknowledged prior to that. In the name of Jesus, you need to believe in Jesus, and you need to believe what Jesus has done for you. Over in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, we read there in that text where, where Peter is talking about how Noah and his family were saved through water. And in verse 21, you read, there is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, 
Peter talks about the importance of baptism, but he notes that baptism is not just about getting wet. When he says it's not the removal of the filth of the, the flesh, but rather it's the answer of a good conscience. It's based upon your understanding of what you're doing. It's based upon your understanding that <coughs> Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that, that you are willing to make Jesus Christ your Lord. That's why the Bible doesn't teach that we should baptize infants. An infant has no ability to, to understand why he is being baptized and what its purpose is. The understanding needs to be there ahead of time. And all of that is associated with this good confession. So uh, uh, that's what we're dealing with as we talk about that. Uh, now, now understand this, another observation as we deal with this confession, is to understand that it's not merely enough just to say the words. Is it possible to believe in Jesus and uh, not be saved? And I believe the answer to that is absolutely. I believe it's a step in the direction of salvation and it's necessary in order to be saved. But you can believe in him. And, and still not be saved. Over in Matthew chapter 7 and in verse 21, Jesus Christ himself said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And he goes on to say that many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? and done many wonders in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Jesus makes the point there, it's not enough to say, Lord. It's not enough to say that I am Lord. You need to do what I tell you to do. And so, so that's an understanding that is associated with this confession. In, in confessing Jesus as Lord, you are acknowledging that you're going to follow him. That, that he is going to be the king and ruler of your life. Over in Luke 6 and in verse 6 or 46, Jesus there said, Why do you call me Lord and do not do the things that I say? You know, there's another interesting occasion that's recorded in the Gospel of John, and this happens after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And as the religious leaders have made this determination that, uh, uh, that it, it, it's time to execute Jesus, uh, that he needs to die. But nevertheless, you read over in John 12, verses 42 and 43. It says, nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. I want you to notice in this text here that it says that, that even among the rulers, there were many that believed in Jesus. They knew who Jesus was, but they were not willing to confess him. And that text tells us that this confession is not merely believing in your mind, uh, in Jesus, and, and it, it might not merely be just even if you publicly tell others that. It, it, it has to be based upon a decision that you're going to do what he tells you to do. And that's really the bottom line as you are dealing with this good confession. And so it's my hope that we can see in this lesson that you need to understand what you are doing as you become a child of God. And, and a part of that is to acknowledge who Jesus is and a willingness to follow him. And that brings me to the next point that I want to make in this particular study. And that is to realize that confessing Christ is not something that is just a one-time thing. Yes, you do it once. You have to do it as you become a child of God. But also, it is something that you need to continue doing throughout your life. So let's just briefly talk about that for a few moments here. And realize that when I'm talking about confession as a Christian here, first and foremost, what I don't have at mind, to, at, mind at least in this lesson, is the idea of confessing our sins. Now, I realize that 
we are called up one to confess our sins. Over in uh, 1 John 1 and in verse number 9, um, John there talks about that if you have sin in your life, uh, as a believer, as a Christian, uh, you need to confess those sins to God. I also see over in uh, uh, James chapter 5 and in verse number 16, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another. Uh, there are times when we need to publicly make confession of our sins because of the nature of what we have done. But what we're talking about in, in the confession in this lesson is we're talking about the good confession. And that is something that must continue to take place even as a child of God. As a matter of fact, it becomes more important as a child of God that you are willing to openly and publicly acknowledge that Jesus is your Lord and that needs to be seen in your life. And so that's the idea of this confession as it continues. Uh, as an example of this, uh, turn back over to that text in, in uh, 1 Timothy 6. In 1 Timothy 6, where Paul is giving Timothy instructions. And I want to actually uh, begin reading a couple of verses earlier. In 1 Timothy 6, and beginning in verse number 11, Paul tells Timothy there, But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing. Notice several things in this text where Paul is telling Timothy, this is a way of life. You made that good confession, and that good confession is something that is seen as you continue to live your life. He began there in verse number 11 by saying, you, O man of God, flee these things. What things is he talking about? And you go what, to what he had talked about previously and among those things. Just prior to this is where he talks about godliness with contentment and, and the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And, and, and he gives the warning, don't pursue uh, worldly possessions and make that your desires in life. You flee uh, uh, greed and you flee ungodliness in your life. That's living a way of life. It's not just a one-time acknowledgement. He goes on after this, and he says, rather than that, you pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. He, he describes these attitudes and actions that are good things, that are a demonstration of how Christ is governing the way that you live your life. He says, fight the good, fight a faith. In other words, you are engaged in a battle against those of this world, against Satan and his forces, and, and, and that involves um, serving Christ. And he goes on and he said there, uh, after he talked about um, the confession that Jesus made, and he says that you keep the commandments, or keep, uh, or keep this commandment without spot, blameless. So the idea is you keep doing the things that you have been told to do. And when you look at all of these descriptions here, they show ongoing action. They're, they're not just simply dealing with uh, something that you did in the past, uh, a single event, but, but rather they're talking about things that you are continuing to do even now. And they show that Jesus Christ is your Lord. You know, I'm reminded of what Jesus said in Matthew 5 and in verse 16, talking about being an example. And he said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. As you are doing good works, you have the opportunity to let them know that Jesus is your Lord. I'm reminded also of Matthew 10, 32 and 33 that we read a few moments ago. This is where Jesus said, Whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. And whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. And again, you may recall as we talked about the background of that text, Jesus is sending out his apostles, and he's telling them, Wherever you go, there are going to be some who are going to accept me, and some who are not. 
And, and, and he says, I want you to speak the truth regardless of that. And this seems to be a situation where, where they were expected to do the right thing regardless. And it's interesting that, that Jesus says, you confess me even in hostile circumstances. Now, that is something that could take place as one is obeying the gospel. Uh, but it's also something that is ongoing in our lives. We are acknowledging that Jesus is going to rule us, that he is going to be our Lord, uh, th that he is our Savior, and, and, and that he is the Son of God. And so we acknowledge all these things about him, and it, and it continues throughout our life. Another verse we might give consideration to is over in 1 John 4 and in verse number 15. And we read in this text, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Now, John, in this text, he's talking about an acknowledgement of who Jesus is. And one thing about uh, the Gospel of John, I believe that it's written uh, primarily to believers, those who are followers of Christ, but also warning them uh, about some who are questioning the character and the person of Jesus, whether or not he physically came to this earth. And John is saying it is important that you understand exactly who Jesus is, and that you're willing to confess that in your life. Uh, you go uh, to verses 2 and 3 of, of this very text, 1 John 4, and, and uh, John says, By this we, you, you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And an interesting thing about the word confess that is used, especially in verses 2 and 3 of that text, is it's what we call a present tense verb. And what that means is it's ongoing action. So John is telling these brethren that you need to continually confess and acknowledge that Jesus Christ did come to this earth. You need to continually acknowledge who Jesus is. That is a part of being the Christian, and it's going to be demonstrated in every area of our life. How many passages of scriptures do we, do we find uh, that, that just emphasize that we no longer belong to ourselves? I, I think of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where, where Paul there challenges those brethren saying, uh, uh, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Where he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be changed. And he makes the point there. You are transformed. And you are a living sacrifice. You now belong to God. Isn't that what Paul said over in Galatians 2 and in verse 20? Where he says that I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul is declaring there, and, and, he, and you find this all throughout Scripture that we need to continue to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh. So we can see there that we are called upon to keep confessing him as Lord, even after, and you might say especially after we obey the gospel. Jesus himself, as, as disciples were saying, uh, they, they wanted to follow him, but they had other things they needed to do first. Jesus said in Luke 9 and in verse uh, 62 no one having put his plow or no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God so let's understand that this good confession that we are to make is something that needs to continue throughout our lives so in conclusion in this lesson as we have seen this confession is something that needs to take place as we become children of God. 
and uh, as you obey the gospel, but also throughout your life. But there's one more thing I want us to understand, and that is that you're going to confess Christ. Over in Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11, Paul thereafter describing how Jesus left heaven and came to this earth, and he was willing to become obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. We read in verse 9, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Friends, you are going to confess Jesus as Lord. You are going to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he is the only hope of salvation. The only question is when. Those who are willing to confess him as Lord before they leave this earth, and those who are willing to confess him and to become children of God and then live faithfully confessing him as a child of God, they will receive an eternal reward in heaven. But those who choose to reject him in this life, trust me, there is going to be a day when you are going to acknowledge exactly who he is. But at that point, it's going to be too late. So let me encourage you to confess Jesus as Lord right now. Confess him as Christ. And if you have never named the name of the Lord and become a child of God, do that today. And we stand ready to help you with that uh, if that is your need. Or if you are a child of God and, and you find that you have not been confessing him as the child of God, repent of those things and go to God and ask forgiveness and resolve that as you move forward that you are going to let your light shine and others will know that you are his disciples. So think about these things. If you will, bow with me at this time. Our dear God and our Heavenly Father, again we come to you and we are thankful that you so love the world, that you are willing to send Jesus to die. And we are thankful for the plan that you have given us through which we can have a hope of spending eternity with you. Help us, dear God, as we live our lives to not be ashamed of our Lord. Help us to be willing to boldly profess our faith in him and by the way that we live our lives to confess that he is our Lord. Go with us through this day and go with us through this week and in all things be glorified in our lives. We ask these things through his name and amen. And again, I want to thank each and every one of you for being here uh, this afternoon and I, I bid you a good day and a good week uh, until next time.